Welcome back, everyone. We're here with another Q&A. We have a, a lot of great people lined up with great questions. We're just going to dive right in, but let me just give you the disclaimer first, which is anything that I say uh, can't be meant to cure anyone. So take it with a grain of salt and check with your doctor before implementing any of the suggestions that we talk about. Um, all right, Steve, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Good morning to everyone around the world. We got some great guests coming to us from, of all places, South Africa and, um, and Switzerland and then all across the U.S. And we have social media to, to whom we love, and we'd like to get to them right away. So Georgia from YouTube says she's lost six pounds and several inches with intermittent fasting, but now have lost a lot of volume in my face. Will this correct over time? I think what you should do is make sure um, that you increase electrolytes and more sea salt because sometimes when you get on the keto, you start dropping a lot of water weight and fluid because it's you, you're getting rid of this excess glycogen that's stored in there. And so, I mean, even think about like a bodybuilder before a competition, they carbo load. That's not muscle. That's uh, they're they're trying to increase more fluid around the muscle to make it look bigger and fuller. So I think um, instead of doing the carbs, just do the fluid with, with a little more salt so you can retain that. And then also, um, I think, um, especially as you do this and you do it healthily, you're going to look more vibrant. And uh, there's always going to be some, some issue with some people when they lose a lot of weight with skin sagging and things like that. But um, Normally, if you add the exercise and gain more muscle, that should help. But I think adding more sea salt wood would be the answer. That's terrific. And by the way, this morning, we want to remind you all that in addition to YouTube and Facebook, we're now on Rumble. Many of you know that. We've hit 100,000 views uh, from Rumble in just the first few weeks on, on a particular show. And so we're very grateful to all of you. Uh, we have about 32,000 subscribers, maybe more. I haven't looked at it in the last few days from Rumble and 1.1 uh, million on YouTube. So we really urge you guys to have sort of dual citizenship. Go over to Rumble, uh, very simple, uh, you know, make an account, uh, like or subscribe to Dr. Berg. And then you got the best of both worlds and it makes you bulletproof. So no one can tell you what you can or can't listen to as it relates to Dr. Berg and others. So so I only have a, a 1.1 million on, on YouTube. Oh, excuse me, subscribers. 11. I mean, a million sounds so Thank big, 11.1, wow. Yeah, it's a little bit more than that. It's all on the decimal point. So 11 million and yeah. 32,000. So come on guys, let's also uh, have dual citizenship go over to Rumble, if you will. Let's move on with the question. Speaking of Rumble, Mary Moore from Rumble. What can I do to get rid of the dark circles under my eyes? <laughs> couple things I would look at, uh, especially um, as we're appro approaching winter, <laughs> you know, you need more sun. I mean, it's hard to get that, but, but the other, the typical thing is going to, it's going to be more a combination of either stress or lack of sleep. Um, I would, I would go after those two in, in, in another a rare occasion. It could be an iron deficiency, slightly anemic, but uh, for more a detailed description, description, I would go right to one of my, YouTube videos on that topic. I think I have like two or three. Okay, very good. Let's go to uh, Blanca from YouTube. Uh, what are the best supplements to take for someone with lip, uh, lymphedema? Lymphedema is always a really tough one because um, um, you, you see this in uh, hypothyroidism and it's not necessarily just a fluid retention. It's actually a it's actually kind of a waste product type material, um, which I'm not going to get into the long name, but it's some some byproduct uh, because the thyroid is not working that well. So there's a couple things that people do. Um, they do um, the rebounder, which is really good to to stimulate the lymphatic system, and um, they also um, take things to help stimulate the thyroid. And um, one is sea kelp. Um, another one is to take selenium, which is really important, especially in the conversion from T4 to T3. Um, but I will say out of all the conditions, that one's the most difficult because, um, it's kind of mysterious and, um, I know certain things can help it, but I have not 
found something that can resolve it, unfortunately. All right. Well, good luck with that. Uh, and uh, Payuri from YouTube, what choices would you offer for a keto on a budget? I guess that's a good question. Is it expensive, Doc? Not if you add intermittent fasting and you can keep the same quality of, uh, um, I'm sorry, you can increase the quality because you're not eating as frequent. You're going to save money. An average person who does <clears throat> one meal a day or two meals a day, <clears throat> excuse me, um, would save between, you know, two or three to $400 a month. So I think you can reinvest that in, the, in increasing more quality, but, um, you know, people think that junk foods or less healthy foods are cheaper. Not necessarily. You could go, you can get healthier foods. And I, I just don't, I, I look at the grocery store and it's, I mean, even going to a fast food restaurant, it's really, really expensive. But being a college student at one time, I would live on like two burgers for a buck. And yes, there are different ways you can cheap, cheap out, but you know, you're going to have to maybe do dirty keto if you do that. But, um, I think I would just do intermittent fasting and then keep the quality higher as you find a better job yeah, so I you had, can afford more food. I had the distinct pleasure of eating with Dr. Berg and he fixed me a keto meal and I didn't see anything on there look like big bucks, some nice greens and a little salad dressing, a pork patty and some cheese. I mean, it looked downright college dorm to me in terms of price, but very delicious. All right, let's move on. Uh, and as from YouTube, how can, what do I, excuse me, how do I prevent cramping and nail splitting uh, and breaking uh, during prolonged fasts? I, I didn't quite. Understand I think it. you you need um, some biotin. I think biotin would help. That usually comes from the gut. Um, that's uh, it's kind of a in the category of a, uh, B vitamins, but also uh, silicon also is good for nail cracking. But I would look at both of those um, being a problem, especially if you're on, if you're doing fasting, you're probably going to add, add some supplement to that. Okay, very good. Let's go with our first question of the day. And here it is, Doc. Okay. Which factor has the most potent effect to decrease cancer risk? Well, we'll all certainly want to know that. I can assure you that. I tell you, why don't we, we've got an interesting lineup in the green room and our guests from uh, Switzerland, uh, uh, Asia, I think, and Daniel. Now, Daniel uh, speaks English. His wife does not, so he's going to translate for her. So this might take a little doing, and we want to give them uh, enough time to be able to do that. And if you would unmute yourself, uh, Daniel, we're going to get you and your lovely wife on the air sure. with Dr. Berg. Welcome to the show, sir and ma'am. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Uh, we have a question about uh, Asia. She has pain in the stomach and the colon. Uh, and also see she has a coris type patient and the other. All the both. Uh, what could she do? Well, she, I, I, now I assume that she's definitely getting on the ketogenic diet, hopefully, and that's what I would advise. But uh, in her case, I think she needs um, some bile salts because that's going to uh, help um, open up the, the ducts between the liver and the small intestine so you have more bile and you'll have um, uh, more lubrication and your digestion will be less uh, of a, a factor and, and you'll have less backup. So, um, because when you have uh, this sludge that builds up in these ducts, it can back up to the pancreas and the gallbladder and create a lot of um, discomfort. So, um, but let's say, for example, you do the ketogenic diet and it doesn't resolve your digestive problem. Then what you need to do is suspect that there could be something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or some type of infl inflammation, in which case you need to go have her on, get her on carnivore for a while. And I bet you that would help her great, um, uh, greatly. You know, you think that, oh yeah, but I'm getting rid of the fiber. Yeah. But the fiber is irritating the colon. You say, well, doesn't fiber help with like a laxative? Not necessarily. It can actually constipate you. <laughs> so, um, uh, with some people, you know, they may need to go up with more fiber. Other people need to go down. Um, I can tolerate probably large, huge salads, but a lot of people, all of a sudden, their their digestive system 
starts doing very well when they go carnivore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, she's now uh, M. 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 She's she's uh, getting Probi probioticum. Probioticum. It's good or not? I'm sorry. Probiot Probiotics. Yeah. Probiotics. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's yeah, good. Probiotics. But but let's say you're you're getting worse with probiotics. That means you definitely have probably SIBO because this small and what happens with SIBO is a condition where you, the bacteria is more in the small intestine, not the large. And then if you add more bacteria, which is a probiotic, it's going to end up creating more bloating and worsening of the situation. So, um, also search out my video on SIBO to see what you should do because Intermittent fasting is going to be very, very important for her as well. Yeah, yeah. I have heard that there are lacti bacillus and bifidu bacillus. He said that that is that is that is by him or bestellen or we can get lacti bacillus and bifidu bacillus bacteria from you. Yeah, those are fine, but if you feel worse when you take it. What that means is you have to fix another thing first before you take that because um, it can bloat you because it's kind of contributes to more bacteria in your small intestine. So test the waters um, and uh, look at my video on it's called SIBO, S-I-B-O. Um, look that up. Yeah. And um, yes, thank you. you're welcome. And one more little thing that might be good is to uh, betaine hydrochloride acidifies the stomach and that seems to um, really be good for SIBO because that way you drop the pH and you get better digestion, especially if there's bloating. So anyway, there's, there's a lot to unpack with the digestion, the digestive system. So um, I would at least start with that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks so much for coming to us from Switzerland and we wish you all the best to both of you. And thank you, sir, for, so adeptly um, describing what your uh, wife's issues are. Okay, let's move on now uh, to the first quiz question. While these nice folks were talking, the audience leapt on it. And the question asks, which factor has the most potent effect uh, to decrease cancer? An answer we all want to know. 75% of respondents say it's fasting or extended fasting. 15% say eliminating refined sugars, and 5% say regular consumption of cruciferous veggies, and 5%, they're the final, say regular exercise and activity. Sounds like some good stuff in there somewhere. You know, I'm going to release a video on this. There's some fascinating new paper that I found that's just mind-blowing, but it the majority got it, and it's the fasting is number one. Fasting is uh, the first thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about the four things that are the most important, but uh, fasting is number one. Fasting is uh, very, very interesting because it um, it can induce something called the anti-Warburg effect, which basically cancer is a condition which originated from a normal cell. So can cancer is not like a virus that invades the cell. It came from your own body because something damaged the mitochondria. And now your cells have to survive. So it switched to an ancient program, like a computer program that uh, has a, this file that can now, uh, has, has to kind of like use this rudimentary type um, metabolism, which is a, that's what the cancer uses, a completely different type of way of getting energy. And in that process, it becomes immortal and it resists um, cell death and all sorts of immune things. But when you do fasting, you make the cancer cell more vulnerable and it loses its advantages, which is fascinating. And it strengthens your normal cells. So, boy, if you want to prevent cancer, if you have cancer, you better include fasting as like your primary weapon to counter this. And 
Steve, I know this might be hard to believe, but fasting is pretty inexpensive. So I haven't had anyone recently that told me they couldn't afford to do it. <laughs> um, but um, it might even save you money. Yeah, well, I really love it. I didn't eat till about six o'clock last night and just felt uh, terrific, had one meal and off I go. And of course, nothing to eat today. Uh, let's me do other stuff like uh, letting uh, everyone know who's listening to the show this morning, in addition to Switzerland and in the United States and Cape Town, South Africa, we'd like to say hello to those in the UK, Canada, Mexico, the Netherlands, Jordan, New Zealand, South, well, South Africa, there you are again, Japan, Belgium, Ethiopia, Peru, Pakistan, United Arab Emirates, Austria, Denmark, Oman, Algeria, the Czech Republic, Portugal, Spain, Turkey, Egypt, India, Eritrea, Poland, Ireland, Taiwan, the United Arab Emirates, Italy, Norway, Romania, the Virgin Islands, Argentina, Nepal, Germany, Nigeria, Morocco, Trinidad and Tobago, Tanzania, and all across these United States. So a little shorter list today, but uh, usually some people say, hey, what about us? And they will chime in later. So we'll be sure to acknowledge them if that should happen. Okay, Sean from Facebook, what advice could you share with women with breast cancer and are going through chemotherapy? Ouch. Fasting, prolonged fasting. I would, I would do a, like a 21 day fast immediately. Um, if you go, <laughs> you won't be able to find any of my cancer videos on, my, on YouTube anymore, but if you go to rumble, you'll find them and then you can get the protocol that would, um, help give you some additional areas to research and uh, things to do. But, uh, that's what I would do. Um, I would also, um, you know, get that protocol. There's a food, there's a kind of like a food, pro, uh, food recommendation as well within that, that area. But, um, but definitely start fasting immediately. All right. Very good. Okay. Gary from YouTube, which vitamins and minerals are best at removing free radicals from the body or his body in this case? Those darn free radicals, Steve, I tell you, they really are. They're just radical. Um, <laughs> There's something called uh, oxidative stress, and that's like a combination between oxidative things that come in that create destruction, and then your ability to counter that with antioxidants that your body can make. So the question is, what type of things can increase your antioxidants to fight these free radicals? There's a lot of nutrients. Um, vitamin C, not ascorbic acid, but a vitamin C complex that comes from nature would be really good. You also have zinc, selenium, um, uh, all, all of the uh, cruciferous vegetables, uh, the phytonutrients in, in certain plants. Uh, there's a lot of herbal things as well, like um, uh, curcumin, uh, garlic. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. There's so many things you can do. Uh, but uh also, and fasting will naturally increase the numbers of your own networks of antioxidants just by fasting, which is pretty wild. So a ketone is also considered an antioxidant. So you definitely need to go on the keto, keto diet. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, and this sounds like a good question. Right. Gratitude is the person's handle from YouTube. What's the difference between insulin resistance and prediabetes? Insulin resistance um, comes before prediabetes and during prediabetes and after diabetes and uh, prediabetes into di actual diabetes, but it's a condition that uh, causes um, prediabetes. If you look at what prediabetes really is, it's uh, you're just starting to lose um, uh, the uh, the cells of the the pancreas that produce insulin. It's becoming tired. So now we have uh, a lessening of the pushdown of the blood sugar. So we have higher blood glucose. And then that gets worse with time. And then you become a full-blown diabetic where now we really have higher sugar. But before that, you can have insulin resistance for 5 to 10, 20 years and have normal blood sugars. Why? Because the, you have this massive uh, production of insulin in the pancreas working hard to push all that sugar that you're eating and carbs down to, to normal. Um, and then the body's going to protect itself 
and resist that going deep into the cells. So um, it's an actual causation versus the prediabetes is a symptom that's caused by this causation of insulin resistance. Wow. Okay. Here is a fun true falser, which requires only a yes or no, you're right or, or not. So there you go, Dr. Bird. All right. True or false. Your BMI body mass index is the best measurement of obesity. Okay. True or false folks. And let's see, I had a question, but it popped by real quick. Um, Oh, what's the uh, MCB wants to know from YouTube, what are the best foods to eat for a pregnant woman? And of course it's pickles, right? Do you have anything to add doc? Pickles are good. Pickles are really good. It's you have, um, you have the benefit of, uh, um, the pickle juice, which is an electrolyte. And uh, also it's fermented hopefully, or it could be just pickled. And then you have some friendly bacteria in there as well. But, um, I think the most important time of someone's life to eat healthy is when they're pregnant and right before and right after when they're uh, breastfeeding because all that nutri all that those nutrients are, are creating this new body and uh, and just one little deficiency of iodine can can actually lower the iq of your child uh, by a significant amount ouch uh, a vitamin d deficiency could significantly uh, affect the formation of your bones. So you could even end up with um, bowed legs and uh, uh, flat feet and uh, scoliosis and a hunchback and dental problems where you're going to need braces and other issues. So it's very, very important to eat the healthy version of keto when you're pregnant, but just not do the intermittent fasting. Maybe just three good meals. That would be good. Wow. A lot of risk in not behaving during that time, huh? Oh, yeah, for your child. Yeah, all right. So, ladies, hope you heard that. Adriana from Facebook, and this is a great question. What do you recommend when we, assuming we all do it, we overeat or eat the wrong foods during the holidays? How long would it take to get back on track for keto? Yeah, um, well, what we do uh, for Thanksgiving, for example, I'll have a bottle of uh, uh, the digestive... Um, uh, enzymes that I have, which basically it has a combination of enzymes and also betaine hydrochloride. And it's kind of an acidifier. So you're eating and I take these before I eat because it really just kind of helps you digest a lot more of that meal. So you can keep eating longer and longer and longer. And so everyone's passing around these, this bottle, but I think the best thing to do is to, um, you know, just like, okay. So, uh, right when you get done with it, you don't drag it on for weeks until the next holiday. Like a lot of people, they have this time between Thanksgiving and New Year's where it's just one big eating uh, situation, procession. So if you could just go off the program, do what you need to do, and then get back on the program, uh, I think that would be a smart thing to do. Um, so many people, I think, have this kind of this, illusion that they're at a certain state of health when they're really lower than that. And they really can't necessarily afford to, to go off too much. But the best way to do this is to get back on is to do a, a nice long fasting after. And I also have a video on all these things that you can do to neutralize the effect of overeating um, and eating poorly. And I did release that video, I think, very recently. So you can watch on my watch that video. All right. Well, speaking of budget, Linda from Facebook says she's been eating a lot of red meat because I can't afford chicken breasts. And by red meat, she means hamburger and chicken legs is what she can afford. Now I have a fatty liver. Is there a connection to this type of eating? I, I highly doubt it came from that. I think... There was something else you ate with that that created the fatty liver because um, when you're eating red meat, it actually um, even has choline, which just like egg yolks have that help counter this uh, fatty liver. Um, in fact, if you look at the video I released today, one of the most anti-inflammatory foods 
uh, is is red meat. It's actually very, very healthy. And I'm not talking about low quality. I'm talking about grass-fed, grass-finished red meat. Um, it's super healthy, um, way better than chicken um, as far as quality. And if you watch that video, you'll learn why. There's a lot of other things, nutrients, carnosine, creatine, all these wonderful things that actually uh, help your body from many different ways. So um, I, I would love to just kind of find out what else you eat just because it could be, it's usually going to be something else that you're eating that's causing the fatty liver and relating to more uh, towards this thing called carbohydrates. All right. How about we uh, take a peek at quiz question number two, which has been answered, and it is a true falser. Your BMI or body mass index is the best measurement of obesity, and I'm hoping that's not true. Uh, and 54% of our respondents say it's false. 46% say it's true. What do you say, Doc? All right. They use it to measure if someone is underweight, normal weight, and overweight and obese. But it's it's it, it's not a good uh, measurement because it doesn't differentiate between muscle and fat. <laughs> so if you take some of the top athletes on the planet who are very lean, but very muscular, they're, they're all considered obese or not obese, but even overweight. Some of them might be obese, but um, it doesn't tell you the difference also between someone's health or sickness or where they're holding the weight. So it's not the best uh, uh, index to use. There's much better ones. Um, the DEXA scan probably would be the best thing, but but also just the uh, hip to waist ratio. There's a simple measurement you can do for that. Um, and then for overall health, to measure health, um, there's much better indicators. I'm going to release a video on that. Um, but there's one test that I'm going to be talking about extensively called heart rate variability and, and how powerful that is to measure uh, your internal health and your biological age and your stress level and whether you should exercise today or not. It's um, very amazing. So I'll be talking more about that soon. Okay. A little report from a rumble. Incredible that your cancer videos can't be found on YouTube. I suspect that they're on rumble. And um, so uh, YouTube, don't take that the wrong way. We're not promising anything other than uh, the cancer videos apparently have been taken down. Now a question from uh, rumble, Dr. Berg, what's your take on using castor oil for cataracts? She's using it for eye drops. Or... Yeah, so I, I don't, um, I don't know. I don't know about that. I do know uh, castor oil is good to help regrow your eyelashes, um, and it's good for certain things. But typically for cataracts, I like the uh, NAC drops. Um, those seem to work uh, pretty good because. Uh, it penetrates uh, and helps as a, as a very powerful antioxidant to help um, what's really behind cataracts, which is called glycation, where you're you're combining this or binding this protein to a sugar molecule, creating this opaque um, thing in your eye. So, yeah, the NAC drops. Um, that's something I would recommend uh, more than castor oil. All right, very good. Well. We've got uh, another exciting guest on with us, and uh, he's from South Africa, and there's the most uh, distinct uh, accent, and the old movie District 9 has sort of introduced a South American accent to the world, and uh, this gentleman's name is Jacques, and Jacques, if you've unmuted yourself, you're on with Dr. Berg for your one question in 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, not Tom. Thomas the Geese. Hi, Dr. Berg. Uh, thank Hello. you for for having me here. So my question is related to type one diabetes, which is a, a sensitive topic. And I've been diagnosed in the beginning of the year, and doctors pretty much said here's some meds to help boost your pancreas, and once that stopped working, you have to go onto insulin. That was the the medical advice that was given, which I didn't accept. And I've been working with a homeopathic doctor on, on this side of the world, Dr. Liesl Fossil, and she put me on a keto diet and she admires your YouTube channel, just by the way. 
And she also put me on a detox plan and anti-inflammatory plan as well, basically. And the antibody count more than halved in eight months or six months, actually. Wow. Yeah. Um, which I haven't heard anything of. I haven't seen any testimonies about something similar happening to anyone else. So it's clearly something is working other than thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what else can I do to keep training in the right direction to get it down to zero, basically? So there's a couple of things that I would recommend. One is I'm glad that the, uh, the practitioner used the um, keto because um, that's going to decrease your need for insulin because as you know, um, the healthier your body's going to do be as healthy as the amount of insulin that you are dependent on. So if you, if you are required to take so much insulin, but now you're not, you're going to be much better off. So just cutting down carbs is going to be a huge step in the right direction. Um, there's another, um, interesting strategy because when you have type one diabetes, it's an autoimmune situation where you have your own body's immune system is attacking your beta cells of the pancreas. And so there's an interesting strategy from the Dr. Royal Lee who developed this back in the thirties and forties, um, by taking, um, a decoy and it goes into your stomach and the antibodies go after that decoy and leave your pancreas alone. So it can actually, you can decrease the inflammation in the pancreas to allow it to just work better. Um, and so, um, the question is, um, what remedy would that be? And I'm not affiliated with this company anymore, but it's from Standard Process. It's a product called Pancreatrophin PMG. You could probably find it online. Pancreatrophin PMG, and you just take one of those before bed and um, see if it can help you. Um, mm -hmm. That that might be a good strategy. And then the other thing, any anything that could have potentially triggered this, which we won't get into this, into this um discussion, you know, you know, think about what happened just before this, and then that can give you a clue as well. But I will say one last point, um, more vitamin D would help you because any uh, autoimmune disease usually has an inflammatory part of it. So more vitamin D, and I'm talking like 40,000 I use per day could also help autoimmune because it's going to drop inflammation. So um, just a, a kickback question on the vitamin D. There's some controversy, and I've watched your videos about vitamin D where they say you can get toxicity and and so forth. Can you take 40,000 IU indefinitely, or is there like a, a take it for three months, then drop it down? What's the recommendation on the trend there? So there are other things. Um, I talk, You should watch the one I did uh fairly recently, recently on the toxicity of vitamin D. And what, what is a toxicity? You would have to take hundreds of thousands of vitamin, I use of vitamin D for months. <laughs> so that's way more than 40,000 I use. Um, the greatest risk would be hypercalcemia and kidney stones. But if you're drinking two and a half um, liters of fluid a day, it's going to be very unlikely that you would ever get stones. Uh, and you can always just test your levels along the way, but here's the problem. Um, and I don't know if you ever had your DNA tested, but a hundred percent of the people, a hundred percent of the people that I tested their DNA, every single one of them had at least one gene that showed some problem absorbing or converting vitamin D. And so this is why the therapeutic doses sometimes need to be higher than just regular amounts. And so that's one factor, but um, vitamin D also greatly supports um, the immune system. And so it'll not just inflammation, but it supports the immune system. And that's kind of where autoimmune problems have taken a dive. Um, also, if you're taking the other factors with the vitamin D, like magnesium, um, like um, K2, these all even buffer that uh, toxicity effect even more. Um, so I would look at both ends and uh, look at the research that I quoted in my video because I think you're going to be quite surprised how much research um, there is that or lack lacking in the area of toxicity. 
Thank you, Dr. Berg. You and, I have, and I have tested my DNA, and yes, it did show that I've got a D3 uh, deficiency. I can't process it properly. And B vitamins as well, actually. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate hey, it. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Jacques. That was a great call. We appreciate it. And we'd, as, as to all of you, we'd love to hear back from you after some time has passed and see how you're going along. And, of course, we always hope that it's, um, you know, it's a downhill for you at this point and you get well and so on. So let's go on to quiz question number three, and there it is. All right, true or false, 90% of the population is infected with HPV. That stands for human papillomavirus. Yuck. All right, I hope I'm in the 10 percentile. All right, so let's go back to YouTube. Karen wants to know, what can I do to fix hair loss uh, I'm having during intermittent fasting? Probably because you're, you you need a bit more B vitamins, uh, trace minerals. Um, that, that would be the first thing I would do. Now, let's say, for example, you're doing a prolonged fast and you lose your hair. Then that typically is going to be you need more protein. But I wouldn't, if you consume protein, that'll throw, throw the fast off and it won't work. So what you can do is you can take a supplement, a really good uh, amino acid supplement to, to get the raw materials for your hair without having the protein. So you're eating the building blocks, which will be, um, so those won't be wasted. They, they won't turn to glucose. It kind of goes right in and gives the body what it needs. So I'm not against taking amino acids with certain prolonged fasts, especially if you are losing your hair or muscle. All right, very good. Well, listen, so we can catch up a little bit. Peg, I'm going to bring you on right now too. Uh, and Peg's an expert. I understand it asking one question in 30 seconds so we can make sure we get to everybody. Peg, do you accept the challenge? I certainly do. All right, go well, ahead. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Berg, <clears throat> excuse me, for allowing me to be on your show. And you have helped me with so many health issues. So my question is, um, frequently I wake up with a hive on my forehead, always in the same area. Mm. And... It, it never seems to come about during the day, just when I wake up in the morning. So I try to take uh, quercetin as an antihistamine. Um, I try to take echinacea, oregano, uh, turmeric, anything that I think might help it. And then and, and as I wander around during the day, then it does uh, kind of settle down. Okay, so there's something that I think might help you and i'm going to show you this is called a h c c it's an extract from shiitake mushroom and it's a very interesting um molecule because it affects the uh it really helps the immune system for things like that with a lot of other things uh, but it's you can probably find it it's called a h c c i would just take don't buy by the highest dosage, I would just buy something that's, uh, you know, not like a thousand milligrams. I think you can get it in either like 500 um, milligrams per dosage. And you just take one before bed and um, take that for a few months and just see if um, that doesn't help you. You'll notice results probably within two weeks, but it's something that um, I recommend for people that have these kind of stubborn immune inflammatory issues that just don't go away. And it has a lot of other interesting effects too. Uh, very powerful for the immune system and um, a lot of research behind it. So I would, I would try that. Um, so you don't feel that this would be a per precursor to shingles? Um, well, if it was, I think AHCC would help you. <laughs> um, okay. And, um, and also the other thing is the interesting, interesting thing that you mentioned is kind of goes away. It comes and goes, comes and goes. So um, yes, it could be related to stress, but you know, an, another effect of this AHCC, another benefit, it seems to help the autonomic nervous system. And I'm talking about the sympathetics, the flight or fight, as well as the parasympathetic. Um, so it has a dual effect, especially for people that have stress induced viral things that come out of remission. Mm -hmm. And so if it like, that would be shingles. <laughs> um, 
but um, and other types of uh, similar conditions. Okay. So it's it's really interesting. It's a uh, I actually um, stay tuned for a video on that topic too because it's a uh, I'm always you know looking at different remedies and researching different remedies that people can use, but uh, very unfortunately you probably won't find those on YouTube anymore because they're now buried so deep. So those videos will probably be on my website. Um, uh, and, and for those of you that don't already know it, I would definitely sign up for drbird.com because I'm going to, I'll be sending out a lot of new things, stuff that's not on YouTube on my site. So that way you can have more knowledge about, especially with natural remedies. Uh, I'll be talking a lot about that. Um, one last thing. I did try the turkey tail mushroom. I just ordered that from Amazon and put it in as a tea. Do you think that would be as good as the shiitake? No, um, that works on uh, a lot of other things. Um, but this one is not just, it's not just shiitake mushroom. It's a very specific extract that somehow you don't get the effect by just eating those mushrooms. They isolated this one compound that has some and they increase the potency. So it has some pretty wild, I mean, there's over a hundred randomized controlled trials on what it can even do for um, warts and um, um, cancer that's related to HPV. I mean, it's just like wild research, uh, wild. So um, I, I, I opened the book, this textbook, this is a clinical guide to this product and I could not put the, put it down. I read the entire cover to cover without stopping because it was so interesting. Wow. Well, Peg, Peg, listen, thanks for coming on with us. We appreciate it and love to hear back from you as well. And let's see, let's go right back to our quiz question, speaking of HPV. And it asks, true, false, 90% of the population is infected with this horrible thing called HPV. And the audience, uh, let's see, where did that go? Oh, oh, there you are. 68% of our respondents say it's true, 32%. Basically, a third say it's false. Who is correct? Okay, so it's true, but there are some references that says it's a little bit less than that. But um, it's roughly up there. It's very, very common. Let's just put it that way. And But the, here's the thing. There's over 230 different strains of this HPV. So not all of them create things like warts and cervical cancer and other issues, um, but some do. And if that's you, if you have, whether it's a very, uh, very uncomfortable wart in the wrong place or whatever, that I would highly recommend searching the research on AHCC because um, that's one thing that um, is very effective for that condition, as well as keeping that HPV under control. And it talks about even wiping that right out of the body. So it's uh, fascinating. And what I'm even more fascinated about is that you can't find this easily on when you do a search on it, like you have to dig deep, but the research is there. So it's almost as if someone's trying to suppress that information, but I know that can't be. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so here's an interesting one, Doc. Okay, true or false? Loneliness can double your risk of diabetes. That would be a sad take. I mean, it's bad enough to be lonely, for goodness sakes. All right, let's see. Uh, Glow 2023 is what this soul is calling themselves, and they're from Rumble. And they want to know, what can I do to get rid of fibroids? Well, I would definitely avoid dairy right now. Um, higher amounts of vitamin D help and also consuming the cruciferous vegetables and or a product called DIM, which is a super concentrated cruciferous compound. So uh, all of these things can help uh, reduce the fibroids. Um, yes, because that's kind of like a, a little mini tumor situation. Yeah, okay. Raymond from Rumble, and I'm humble to read this. This is uh, sad for a lot of people. What would you suggest for someone with chronic anxiety, sadness, and difficulty fitting in with others? We feel your pain, Raymond. What do you say, Doc? I think I would do uh, the B1. Uh, you need a lot of B1. B1 tends to pull people out of 
um, these lower emotion states as well as doing fasting. Steve, I told you this before. I don't know if you remember it. I, we have, a, I did a success story on this or this, or this video on this gentleman who, um, was very depressed, suicidal. Um, um, he decided to take his life and he locked himself in his room and stopped eating. He figured he would starve himself to death. By the third day, he was so happy and so he felt so good because the fasting uh, helped his mood that he decided not to do that and turned his whole life around and uh, he's doing great now. But uh, fasting uh, brings you up. Um, so does keto. So does B1. And so does vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency you can get depressed, even especially like this is why in the winter people get the blues because they, they need that vitamin D. Well, well, Raymond, take a walk for goodness sakes. What could it hurt? That sounds like a, a, a very um, hopeful story. Okay, let's see. Uh, Yvonne, oh, go ahead, doctor. Do you have something to say? Oh, I was just going to say, yes, you're right, Steve. Um, start exercising, start walking, start moving. Uh, it's very hard to feel down when you're moving at a very high pace. <laughs> no kidding. Okay, Yvonne from Facebook, would mushroom coffee help reduce inflammation? I think it would. I think there's these mushrooms are just fan, I mean, just amazing to me because uh, they have all these interesting effects, not just anti-cancer, but uh, growing your brain cells back, um, uh, re reversing certain diseases, dropping inflammation, I think they're extremely uh, valid, and I would definitely, definitely do that if I were you. Okay, very good. Let's see. Um, let's go to Tom. He's been waiting patiently, uh, and he's a nice fellow from New Hampshire. And Tom, I'm going to unmute you, and if you do the same, we're going to get you on right away with Dr. Berg. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hello. Hello, Dr. Berg. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I took a CT heart calcium test and scored very bad about three weeks ago. Uh, my agastatin was 1,437. I have no symptoms. I went into the hospital and had an echocardiogram and a stress test, and I aced it. I did great. Um, at the beginning of July, I weighed 296 pounds. I'm 6'2". Um, this week, I weighed in at 250, and that's due to no sugar and inter intermittent fasting. Um, this week I began eating the natto sticky beans, um, 1.8 ounces a day. I'm concerned with the side effects of the atrostatin that I take every day, uh, because it doesn't allow the K2, it doesn't allow the B, it doesn't allow these things to go through. I have an appointment with my primary care doctor on Tuesday. I'd like to ask if I can come off of that statin drug and try this for six months, do another CT test and see how that works. Um, what's your thoughts on my plan and are, is there anything else I can do to help get rid of some of this calcium that's in my arteries? So did they find that your lipid profiles were out of range? I don't know what that means. And I don't know if they did. Oh, I, I, high cholesterol? No, high cholesterol? No, no high cholesterol. My cholesterol is great. So why did they put you on the statins? As soon as I went in with any kind of a heart problem. I, I've been on a low, I was on a 10 milligrams of um, the statin probably since 1997. They put me up to 20 milligrams about two years ago because my cholesterol started rising. And now when I went in the hospital three weeks ago, they put me up to 40. Wow. It's interesting because um, statins focus on the cholesterol thinking that, oh yeah, you have high cholesterol. Well, you don't, uh, you have a calcium problem. Why don't they give you something for that? They know it's the statins because it's kind of a routine thing. You you may be, uh, I think you, you probably have an advantage to find a cardiologist that does keto that you can work with remotely and have them make those adjustments. And, you know, because the statins um, have some, some issues. They come with the package, especially the, um, the statin-induced myopathies. <laughs> especially in your mitochondria, especially what they do with, uh, they deplete your coenzyme Q10 because you, hopefully you're on that or you've been on coenzyme Q10. Um, if anytime anyone's on a statin, they have to be on coenzyme Q10 um, because um, they're missing this, something in their mitochondria that can really mess you up. So um, I would, um, 
Um, also take the vitamin K2 to help start uh, mobilizing or slowly bringing down this calcium score. But, but here's the thing. I think you're on the right track. Um, you cleaned up your diet. You're losing weight. Um, staying on healthy keto. And then what I would do is I would retest it in two months. And uh, I think you're going to see it come down and, and then test it another couple months, have it come down more. And uh, because there's people that can actually reverse that. And um, it's just a matter of, yes, you're on the high side, uh, but now we have a score so we can measure it. It's good that you, you found that out now because if you didn't find that out, you probably wouldn't be as motivated to make the changes. But, um, but um, I, it can come down. You're doing all the right things. And um, it just means that um, probably I wouldn't recommend like major exercise. I would do walking. I would do some and weight training and things like that. But I wouldn't go high pulse rate, anything like that right now uh, because of the uh, how stiff the arteries probably are because of the calcium. But... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that, that statin. I would, I would work with another cardio that does keto. Uh, I'll have to provide that on my website because there's a great um, site that you can find a doctor remotely that really knows about this a bit more than the t- traditional doctor, so you could work with someone on the med part. Um, but, yeah, I think you're on the right track. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. That's great. Thanks so much, Tom. We wish you well. I'd love to hear back from you in two months. So if you can't get in the queue for the, the on-air thing, you know, write drberg.com, go and, and make a comment or get us on the comments here during the show. We'd love to hear about your progress. Speaking of progress, uh, the audience leaps right on every question. And the fourth question asks, true, false, loneliness can double your risk of diabetes. And 92% of our respondents say it's true. And 8% say hogwash. Who's right? It is it's true. There's some interesting data on that. Um, social isolation and loneliness basically increase your risk, not just of, of diabetes, but cancer as well. So um, it makes sense because it. Um, I think social interaction is a necessity for, for humans. I think especially just like food, like we need that. And uh, when we don't have that, it really uh, can affect um, our health. So uh, I'm, stay tuned for um, a video on that topic. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, audience, we want you to get a little thoughtful now with this next question. Go ahead, Doc. All right. What do you feel is the primary reason for never getting better health-wise? Interesting question. All right, let's see. In, in the meantime, let's go to Absurd Antics is the handle from Rumble. What would you suggest to address bloating after a meal? Cut out the donuts. What else? You know, I, you, you, you could also, you could take a bile supplement. Um, but I think I would start with a betaine hydrochloride supplement and, um, that acidifies the stomach to the point where, um, uh, it should get rid of the bloating. Of course, I'm assuming your diet is good, but I shouldn't assume that because just probably you're eating something that's creating the bloating, um, in the area of grains or seed oils, uh, or sugars, I would eliminate those too. Um, but I used to have some serious bloating all the time and I didn't realize how important my diet was. So I, I would take supplements and they wouldn't work, take enzymes and things. So I think I'm going to take that answer back and give you another one. I would change your diet first. Then if that didn't work, add the betaine hydrochloride. And and what diet do I recommend? Of course, go to drberg.com and just it's right there. You can download the diet that that you need to be on. All right. Poor Daryl from Facebook uh, has been blowing leaves incessantly. This is the, um, the time of year and wants to know what he can do about horrible chronic tennis elbow. Well, I'd like to know if it's on the right side, because if it's on the right side, believe it or not, and you might think I'm crazy on this one, but I... You could, it could be related to gallbladder. Um, I've just seen that in practice so many times. And if you just press underneath your right rib cage and see if that tennis elbow goes away, then we know for sure. Um, and then you have to work on supporting the gallbladder. But another, another little trick you can do is if it's on one side, you massage the opposite 
elbow and the do the mirror image exact spot on the opposite side and just massage in there and you're going to find your tennis elbow goes right away so by working the opposite now how do we know what exact points to press well it'll be very very severely tender if once you find the exact points because when you hit the mirror image side it's just super tender and that would be what you want to work on and you do the work on that and watch that tennis elbow go away all right, that's terrific. Let's see now. We're waiting for the final questions. In the meantime, or answer, excuse me, Lorosity Laros, from YouTube, can cancer grow on glutamine as well as glucose, which could negate the positive effects of keto on cancer? Yes, yes, yes. Um, there's definitely controversy on this topic because certain uh, theories say that it can only live on sugar. Cancer only lives on sugar. And then cancer can live on sugar and glutamine, which is, I believe, to be true. And then cancer can also live on ketones, which is, I believe, to be true. Some people disagree, but there's some fascinating research out there. And I will say this. Um, there's one thing I know for sure is there's a lot of unknowns <laughs> for cancer. I mean, there's a lot of these, there's so many theories and you have these people are so convinced, but um, that this is why I recommend doing fasting as much as possible. That way you can eliminate everything. But now you're going to say, well, wait a second. When you fast, you release ketones. That could feed the cancer. But apparently when you fast, the ketones from your own fat that are generated act differently than the ketones from the diet. And I, I have a research paper on that as well. Uh, in addition to when you do fasting, there's a whole bunch of other things that kick in that help you get rid of cancer. So um, if you're trying to get rid of cancer and you're just thinking, I'm going to go on the ketogenic diet, I don't think that's the answer. I don't think that's going to be the answer because I know people who tried that and it didn't work. Um, so I, there's other things you have to do. Um, and this is why we have Rumble, to find those videos to get the full picture. Okay, very good. Well, we are able to get through all the um, questions today. Thank you, audience, for your help on that. The last one, what, can, uh, what do you feel is the primary reason for never getting better health-wise? And they got into this, and let's see. 60% uh, of our respondents say it's consistently poor diet. 20% say it's a lack of physical activity. 10% say it's an unhealthy attitude. I See that? And 10% say it's a closed mind or the horrible depression. Doc, have they been thought? So, so this is just an interesting topic, and I'm going to be putting this video on my website, not on YouTube. So, so that's why you need to subscribe. But um, in practice, um, in, for 30 years working with 40,000 people, um, the, even for my own lack of getting better for years, it was – because I wasn't on the right diet. I was not on a low carb diet. I didn't do intermittent fasting. I didn't think that was anything. Um, so right there, that's probably the most important thing. The second thing is that a person has this, um, they've been diagnosed incorrectly. They give, be given the wrong diagnosis and they're going to give the wrong treatment. And this happens so often, even when you diagnose yourself, uh, it's so important to get an, an actual evaluation that looks at everything to, not jump to conclusions too fast. And then, of course, uh, if someone's on a lot of medications, right, the diet's not going to work. The supplements aren't going to work. Uh, I have a person who um, lives close to me that was on, she's in her 30s, she was on almost 10 different medications. Nothing's going to work because we don't know what medication side effect is causing this and that. So um, that's another blocker of progress, especially since the medications can destroy the mitochondria. On that note, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for sticking around this long. Uh, I'll talk to you guys next week, same time.